So I have a homework assignment for you to take with you as you go today. And uh, it's to answer a simple question. And the question is this. Are you a stubborn person? If you said, I ain't doing no stupid homework, the answer is yes, you're a stubborn person. If you look at the person who's next to you, go ahead, look at them, and they will shake their head and believe them, you are a stubborn person. If you are sitting here going, I, I don't do no stinking homework from church, I don't even know why you're asking this, I'll have a hard time not falling asleep, the answer is already, you've already done your homework. But the, the reality is, I am a stubborn person. I'm not asking you, are you stubborn different from me? No, are you as stubborn as I am? Because I came from the factory as a stubborn person. I am well practiced in how to be a stubborn person. And the, the entry level stubbornness for me has to do with how, what I eat. I am a picky eater, and I was raised not to be. I was raised on a farm. I mean, I started off as an adorable child, but very soon I became a stubborn child. It didn't take long, and even though I was raised on a farm, I refused to eat vegetables. And I know that doesn't make sense, but it's like my friend Joe says, vegetables are what food eats. But I didn't like, I ate corn and potatoes, but that was it. Anything other than corn and potatoes, I wouldn't eat. And this was a problem because I was raised by Depression era parents and grandparents. And when you're a farmer in the Depression, you eat what you grow. And if it's put on your plate in front of you, you're supposed to eat it. In fact, my father had a club that all of us as children had to be a member of. It was called the Clean Plate Club. And we couldn't get up from the table until our plate was clean. And literally, there were three and four hour dinners in my home where I just sat and stared at a piece of broccoli. And to this day, I will need how to eat broccoli, cauliflower, or Brussels sprouts. And I know Brussels sprouts are so hip. They are so nouveau. And I've been to those restaurants, those fancy schmancy restaurants where they where they cook the they cook the Brussels sprouts and sprouts in garlic and butter and crack or whatever they put on them. So you can't even taste whatever a, a Brussels tastes like. And then and I'm there with people that are like, oh you gotta try them, you gotta love them. No, I do not. I do not. In fact, one time when I was a kid, I refused to eat the Brussels sprouts that were on the plate in front of me, and my father gave me an ultimatum. He said, Dave, either you eat the Brussels sprouts, or you go outside and eat grass. And I went outside and laid on the lawn and started sticking grass in my mouth. So if you are a stubborn person, you are not alone. We come from the factory with the ability to be stubborn. I don't know how many of you have raised a child, but you don't have to teach your children to be stubborn. You never have to sit down with your kid and go, okay, here's how, it is. Here's how you be stubborn. And they're like, no, I, I would rather do everything you say, mommy and daddy. Have you had a two-year-old? You understand they call it the, two -year, the terrible twos because they learn the power of one word. No. And it is the ground, it is ground zero for a stubborn life. But here's the interesting thing I've observed. I've observed that stubbornness is a two-edged sword. That stubbornness actually, even though we know, we know that stubbornness can be toxic. We know that we can weaponize our stubbornness. We know that stubbornness can lead to belligerence and, and dogmatism and, and a lot of things that are abrasive and, and uncomfortable and, and terrible relationally. But stubbornness can also lead to good things. It can lead to determination and faithfulness and loyalty. It's that thing that my parents used to call stick to follow through. You see, there's a redemptive side to stubbornness. Stubbornness can be sanctified. So how do we do it? How do we, how do we minimize the toxic and corrosive stubbornness that we're naturally inclined to, to do? 
and increase our sanctified stubbornness? How do we develop redemptive stubbornness that is faithfulness and loyalty and dependability and reliability? That's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how do we do that? How do we develop sanctified stubbornness? How do we redeem our stubborn streak? But before we talk about that, I am going to stubbornly pray. Lord, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight. That you would use your words spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to challenge us to redeem our stiff necks and our strong wills. May we sanctify the stubbornness and develop a faithfulness and a loyalty that actually makes the lives of others around us better. Pray that for myself, for my family, for all of us here. For I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. In your Bible, the first four chapters of the New Testament, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of the four Gospels, the shortest of the four Gospels is the book of Mark. Mark is the briefest of the four Gospels, and I think with good reason, because Mark's intention in telling the story of Jesus is to describe for us the life of a humble servant. And a humble servant expects no embellishment. It expects no grand stories that, that call attention to themselves. It's, it's really sort of a, a chronicle of self-sacrifice and servitude. And Mark's gospel is the shortest of the four gospels. It's only 16 chapters long. But what's interesting about the brevity of Mark's gospel is it's possibly shorter than we think. The last chapter of the book of Mark, of the Gospel of Mark, has 12 verses at the end of it that some people believe were not supposed to be there. They are, uh, they are an addition that the evidence would suggest was added after Mark completed his Gospel. There are students who are way more intelligent than I am who, who study the, the sourcing of what we have as, <laughs> as our Bible. And, and they examine the, the, the manuscripts because there's thousands and thousands of handwritten manuscripts that date back almost to the first century. And while we don't have the original manuscripts from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul, we do have copies of what we believe were those original manuscripts, perhaps two or three or four or ten generations copied down the line. And the amazing thing isn't that there are some some discrepancies, some inconsistencies as we line up those, those manuscripts. The amazing thing is that there are so few. But this is one of the sections of the Gospels. The other is in John chapter 8, the first 11 verses, the story of the woman caught in adultery. These are two sections, particularly the section in Mark, where scholars are divided. The evidence is inconclusive. We're not sure if these 12 verses were original, or perhaps one day someone went in and said, I don't like how the story ends. Let's add this. And, and it sounds like it was something that fit. Or possibly it was on a sheet of papyrus, and one day one of the scribes came in, he had too much mead the night before, or had a fight with his wife, and as he's walking into the scriptorium, he dropped a page and he didn't know it. And when he finished the book of Mark, it ended at verse 8. And nobody thought anything of it. And from then on, every copy after that ended at verse 8 because the page that had the other verses on it got lost somewhere. Or maybe somebody read it and went, this doesn't sound right. Maybe we should set it aside. But of all of the, all of the reasons, all of the studies, why scholars are, are guessing why Mark ends with this sort of textual variant, the lessons that are there, I, I want us to think about for a moment. I don't want to ignore the, the, the textual complexity, but I want to look at the first six verses of this section, beginning at verse 9 in Mark chapter 16. This is a story of what happened immediately after the resurrection, and it's a story of unbelief. 
It says in verse 9 that after, after Jesus was raised from the dead, early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was the woman out of whom Jesus had cast seven demons. It says that she then went to tell the disciples who were grieving and wailing what had happened. But when she told them, not only that Jesus was alive, but that she had seen him, it says they did not believe her. Next verse, verse 12, says that afterward, after this time, there were two men who were who, two followers of Jesus who were walking, and Jesus appeared to them in another form. This is a story that Luke records in Luke chapter 24, the story of the men who were walking to the village of Emmaus. In Mark's gospel, it says they were leaving Jerusalem and going to the country. The story of Mary encountering Jesus is recorded in Matthew and Luke and John, but this is just recorded in Luke and here in Mark. And it says that they, they rushed back to their friends, to the others, and they told them what had happened, but no one, no one believed them at all. Finally, he says in verse 14 that sometime later, Jesus appeared to the disciples while they were gathered together having a meal. This story is recorded for us in John chapter 20 and at the end of Luke. The John 20 story is the story of doubting Thomas that we looked at on Easter Sunday. But in Mark, in Mark chapter 14, it says that Jesus appeared to them as they were eating a meal. And it says he rebuked them for their unbelief because they, because they stubbornly refused to believe to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. They stubbornly refused to believe. The word for unbelief, apistuo or epipistuo, appears four times in three verses. In verses 11 and 13, it appears each time where it talks about how the disciples, when they heard uh, reports of Jesus' resurrection, they couldn't believe it. But in verse 14, it's repeated twice. Jesus rebukes them for their unbelief, and it's because they stubbornly refused to believe. And it's the word stubbornly that catches our attention. It is, it is the word uh, stagacardia. It's a compound word, sclerocardia. Sclerocardia, the word cardia, we would recognize because it's, it's actually been co-opted medically. It's been transliterated, cardiac. Cardiac is the Greek word, cardia, for heart. Sclerao has also been co-opted medically. In medical terms, have you heard of multiple sclerosis or arterial sclerosis or a, have a scleroderma? Scleroderma is the hardening of the skin. The word sclerao means to harden. Literally what Mark chapter 16 verse 14 is saying is that Jesus rebuked them because their hearts grew hard because of their stubbornness, their scleraocardia. They, they were unable to believe what, what God was doing because of their hardness of their heart, because of their stubbornness. I see this all the time. I see it in people who refuse to believe. And most of the time, it's symptomatic of something else. Most of the time when I meet people who absolutely refuse to believe and they're, and they're militant in their unbelief, I, I look at them and I think, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Because the reason you are not believing, the reason your heart has grown hard is one of two things. One is pride. It's easy to develop a hard heart because we know it all. Because we've been there, we've done that. We've, we've seen these things and we believe that, that we are, we are, we are self-contained in our knowledge and in our ability, in our capacity. We are self-determining. And it's our pride and our ego and our arrogance that closes us off to the idea of God, to the idea of a loving God, to the idea of a redeeming God. Because we don't need that. Because we are self-sufficient. 
But even though they say it, I know that inside of them beats a heart that longs, that longs for a savior and longs for a redeemer and longs for a true friend. The other reason is fear. I think people, people harden their heart because, because God has disappointed them. Their expectations, whether they were realistic or not, have gone unmet. God has, God has not conformed to what they thought God should be. And they say, I won't be fooled again. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, God. Shame on you. And they close off their heart. They harden their heart because, because they're afraid. They're afraid to be hurt again. They're afraid to feel something that does not last. They're, they're afraid to be vulnerable to a God that they don't trust. So what do we do about that? If, if those are the things that develop in us, that toxic stubbornness, how do we develop sort of a redemptive stubbornness, a, a sanctified stubbornness? I want to suggest two things, two practices that I have, that I have engaged in for decades that I learned as a young man are, are values that help me maintain a healthy heart, that help, me, that help me push back on the natural stubbornness that is both corrosive and toxic in my life. And the first practice is the practice of transparency. Being who I say I am, doing what I say I will do, being the same in every situation, a consistency, an honesty, an authenticity, a transparency in who we are. And, and it's, it, this is a hard thing to do because certain situations call for certain boundaries and certain behaviors, and I understand that. But what I try to do is I try to be the same person here now as I am at home. One of the greatest compliments that I have ever received from my own children is when they say to me and they say about me, dad is the same, he's the same guy, whether he's at home or whether he's on the stage, whether he's preaching or whether you're having a beer with him, he's the same guy. Now I realize how tricky that is because there are certain circumstances where we have to, we have to be careful because, because, because exposing ourselves too much, dropping trow and streaking emotionally in front of people is too traumatic. And we understand that you don't do that with your children. There are times when you don't tell your children all of the things that you're feeling or thinking or all of the things that are going on because they don't need to know it. They can't handle it. You're not dishonest. You're just editorializing. You're careful. There's a guy here at Riverbend. He's an airline pilot, Mike Furman. He flies for American Airlines. And I can imagine flying with Mike. And Mike's a captain on the airplane. And I, and I can imagine I'm sitting there and Captain Mike's on the plane and all of a sudden lights start going off in the cockpit and there's a, there's a, a very dangerous situation, a life-threatening situation. And he knows it as the pilot that this is dangerous. And so he picks up the microphone and he goes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Captain Mike speaking to you. Hope you're having a pleasant flight. I just wanted you to know that we're going to die. We're going to die. We're, it's over. Put your head between your legs because we're done. That's not information I want to have. I mean, he may say, uh, we'll be landing very soon. <laughs> not untrue. But he, did, he doesn't need to tell me that. And I understand, I understand that, that we have to be mature enough to know that there are some things that we share and some things that we don't. There's such a thing as oversharing or inappropriate sharing, but the difference is, the difference is hypocrisy. If I am one thing over here and another thing over here, if I say I believe one thing in this situation and I act like I believe a different thing in another situation, it is symptomatic of a sclerocardia. It's symptomatic of a hardened heart. And we push back on a hard heart by always being transparent, by being authentic, by being honest. It's the first practice that I've practiced for decades is I try to be who I say I am. I try to be the same person if you meet me in, on the street or if you meet me in my home or if you see me here at church. 
Same guy, for better or for worse. The second thing I try to do is I try to develop teachability. Teachability. It means I, I remain relentlessly curious. I, I'm constantly a student. I want to learn more. I wasn't always this way. When I was 28 years old, I became a pastor for the first time, a senior pastor. And I had literally been in school for 10 years, 10 years, studying theology, preparing for my career. And I knew everything, everything. After 10 years, I knew everything I needed to know. And I was sure of it at 28. And I remember I had a wise friend, an elder in, in our first church. His name was Mike. He was a math professor. He was also the headmaster of a Christian school. And he took me under his wing. And he would, he would gently tell me things that he was learning from me. Things that I was, that I was teaching him. He would say, I didn't, I didn't know that. That was good. Let's talk about that. And he was modeling for me a teachability. As I got to know him over the years, he said to me, Dave, one of the great attributes of good leaders is that they are always teachable. They are constantly learning. They are desiring to better themselves relentlessly. They never know it all. And I believe that he was absolutely right. There's a meme, and it's attributed to a guy named Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc was the founder of McDonald's, and he said it this way. As long as you're green, you'll grow. It's when you're ripe that you begin to rot. And what Ray was basically saying is as long as you remain teachable, as long as you are willing to say, I don't know, I didn't know that, it allows us in that, in that spirit to maintain a soft heart. It protects us from sclerocardia. So it protects us to be, to be transparent and to be teachable. Which is why I can't tell you exactly whether or not Mark 16 is original to the Gospel of Mark. The, the, evidence, the evidence is kind of 50-50. The textual evidence is divided. There are some early manuscripts that have it and some that don't. Scholars who are, who are grammarians have read it and said the syntax and the grammar and the language is different than the rest of Mark. So it seems, it seems like it may have been added, but there are others who make the argument. He was, he was just summarizing things. So, of course, he uses a different syntax, a different cadence, different vocabulary. And so, so the scholars are divided over whether or not it is, it is authentic or not. And, and most people who have studied the end of Mark chapter 16 come to the point where, where basically whether or not they believe it's part of the gospel of Mark has less to do with the textual evidence and the syntactical evidence than what it says. And the controversial part isn't the six verses we looked at. It's the next verses because they get weird. This is what it says in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And then he, Jesus, told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. That's not controversial. That's Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the Great Commission. No big deal. Then he says in verse 16, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Okay, that's a little harsh, but Jesus has an edge. Jesus at times you know, separates the sheep and the goats. He, he, he can put an edge on his teaching. I'm not comfortable exactly with that. It doesn't fit with everything, but we can make that work. And then it starts to really drive off the edge. Verse 17. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. First, they will cast out demons in my name. You do that today? You've been casting out demons in his name? You say, yeah, I cast them out with coffee. I cast out the demons of sleep. I know this is not what that's talking about. This is talking about actual metaphysical demons. And I know it's possible. I know it's possible, but it doesn't happen to me very often, ever. And then it says, and it will speak in new languages. I've heard of that. Ecstatic utterances, speaking in tongues. I know people that have prayer languages, and it's very sincere. Okay, that's, that's possible. And then verse 18 shows up. 
And they say, they will be able to handle snakes with safety. Okay, next Sunday, vipers. <laughs> Pass around vipers, cobras, water moccasins. I mean, and there are people, have you seen them? Snake handlers? This is where they come from. Comes right here. They're saying, the Bible said it, therefore I believe it, and it's true. And so they handle snakes. And then it goes on to say, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. There's an argument for eating Brussels sprouts right there. <laughs> then it says they will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed, which is, these are, these are, this is not so far afield. I mean, it's awkward, it's weird, it's, it's tough to make fit into sort of our little theological box. But I think the thing that is true, and, 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 and you can be smarter than me and do the research on the, on the textual evidence and make your decision, but I think the principle is still true. That if we want to push back against the, the stubbornness that is toxic and corrosive, it means to have a soft heart, not be victimized by sclerocardia. And I would suggest we do that by transparency and teachability. Because we're all stubborn, all of us are. The quiz isn't really fair because the answer is yes for all of us. There was a study that was published in 2015 by the British Journal of, of Psychological Development. And these are, these are people who did a 40-year study 40 years before 2015, they identified 700 children who they considered to be stubborn and strong-willed between the ages of 8 and 12. And they went back and they interviewed them 40 years later to see how these 700 stubborn and strong-willed children turned out. And this is what the journal article said. At the start of the experiment, researchers looked at the children's behavior including inattentiveness, sense of inferiority, impatience, rule-breaking, and defiance of parental authority. In other words, they looked for Dave. The same people were then examined for the same traits 40 years later. It looked at how behavior in late childhood could predict participants' success later in life, and whether or not stubbornness was a factor in achieving throughout their adult careers. The results showed that children who frequently broke the rules, defied their parents, and get this, and were a responsible student, were the ones who went on to be high achievers and earn the most in their careers. The authors postulate that such children might be more competitive in the classroom, leading to better grades. As, adult, they, as adults, they may be more willing to fight for their own financial interests and personal beliefs, even at the risk of annoying friends and colleagues. Redemptive success is a, redemptive stubbornness is actually a predictor of success not only in business, but in life, and I think spiritually, to stay teachable and to stay transparent. Being a picky eater and raised stubborn, I have, I have had to learn how to, how to try things that I don't like. It was at the end of 2004, Diane and I were in the process of wrestling with where we were going to be doing our next ministry. We had spent 20 years in Dallas, and we were in Northern California for four years, and the situation in California did not turn out to be something that we could do long term. So we began a year-long process of, of searching for what was next. And it's not like a regular job search when you're searching to become a senior pastor because you're interviewing with 3,000 bosses. And so it took some time, and after after a year of, of searching and interviews and conversations and sending out resumes, we had narrowed the field to four different churches, two of which we were trying to decide which was our first choice. And it was at the end of 2004, we were coming back from a family conference at Hume Lake, a Christian camp where I spoke in Central California, and we were driving back, and I said to Diane, let's commit to pray together every morning and every evening, 
and to do a 40-day fast, to fast and pray for 40 days. And surprisingly enough, she agreed. She said, sure. Now, we didn't do a 40-day fast where you didn't eat anything for 40 days. We ate, drank protein shakes and, and drank soup broth, but no solid food for 40 days. Now, I wish I could tell you that after a week, oh, the Spirit of God just came over us. I wasn't even hungry anymore. That's, a, that's absolutely not true. I was hungry every day for 40 days. Do you know how many commercials are on TV for food? They're on all the time. And when you're 20 and 30 days into a 40-day fast, you would eat the chair you're sitting on just to have some kind of solid food. And on day 34 of our 40-day fast, we were flown to Austin, Texas for an interview with the search committee of Riverbend Church. And it was the idea of the search committee to take Dave and his wife to County Line Barbecue for dinner. I'm 34 days into a 40-day fast that I had not told them about. And I'm sitting there with a glass of water. And I don't know if you've been to California and you've ever tried to have barbecue in California. I have one word for you. Don't. They don't understand what barbecue is in California, so we have been four years without real barbecue, and I'm sitting in the county line going, oh, no, I'm fine with my water. And I was thinking the search committee was just going, we can't hire this guy. He's an idiot. He don't even like barbecue. But I was 34 days into this 40-day fast, and only one more week. And at the end of that week was our middle daughter Leah's birthday. And we were going to celebrate Leah's birthday and Caitlin's birthday since they're just a few days apart. And I said to him, we're going to take you out to dinner. 40th day of the fast. I'm going to break it. I'm going to get a big fat steak. And I'm going to eat myself into a meat coma. And so they said, no, Dad. We want sushi. <laughs> and for the entirety of 49 years of my life, I had never eaten sushi. Because sushi was evil. Because sushi made about as much sense as walking out into a field and taking a bite out of a cow. Eating raw fish, I just couldn't imagine it. But after 40 days, they put in front of me a piece of raw tuna, and I ate it. And I liked it. In fact, one of my favorite restaurants in the world is here in Austin, and it's a sushi restaurant called Uchi. And I would go there, if you said, let's go there for lunch, I would say, drop what we're doing, we're going to Uchi for lunch. But I never, ever would have been able to even get to a point where I would have tried it. Maybe I didn't need a 40-day fast. Maybe all I needed to do was be transparent and teachable. So your quiz, your question, your test is to ask yourself this question. Are you a stubborn person? I leave the answer to you.